Okay, so I think people are going to start coming back in. But as they do, today, Tony is at ENLC, and we have John Black speaking here. So I have known John for many years. Most of his life, that is true, yes. As a little boy, I remember him. And Tony and I um, very much see ourselves as spiritual parents to John and Carla. We really love them. We um, just the heart that they serve with, that they will always go the extra mile to help other people. And I'm sure there are many people in here and watching online who have felt and received that love and care from John and Carla. But equally, as much as that love and care that they carry, they carry um, the word of God, they carry direction, they carry authority. And since they have become lead pastors at NLC, we have seen them grow so much. And is leading a church easy? Sure, sure. Are you telling the whole truth? No, <laughs> <laughs> but we love it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, often we learn the most and the best lessons when we're actually doing them. Yeah. You can learn about it at school. You can learn about it in class. You can write about it. You can read about it. But until you're mm -hmm. actually doing it, you don't truly, totally understand but John and Carla are doing amazing, and I just would love you to honor John as he comes to speak to us this morning. So, Father, I just thank you for John. I thank you for the word that you have given to him to share with us this morning. And I just pray, Father, that your words would come out of him, that what you want to share with us, he would just open his mouth and he would know that the Holy Spirit is working through him. We thank you for him and we bless him this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you, Essie. Good morning, everyone. You know, it makes me so happy to see faces that I know but it makes me even happier to see so many faces I don't know. Um, so if you don't know who I am, hi, I'm John. <laughs> I'm kind of part of the furniture for a long time. And Carlo and I um, are just so privileged to be part of this house. You know, you, I don't know how long you've been in the church, but just so you know, this isn't just a local church. This is a ministry of God. And there are churches all over the world. There are live stream churches all over the world. And, and Carlo and I, uh, planted ENLC uh, out of here uh, a year ago on the 2nd of January. How crazy is that? A year already. And we're just seeing so much of God's favor and blessing on the house, seeing healings, but the, my favorite one is healing of the heart and transformation. We're just seeing people radically transformed in their culture and their understanding of what they see of the kingdom of God. And it's, it's so good to be with you guys. And Carla sends her love. She's completely jealous that I'm here, um, but she loves her people, so she, she was kind of torn, so she stayed at home today with them, but she sends her love. Well, I feel it's right that we start off with something corporate. I feel we need to have a corporate time of forgiveness for Harry Kane. Um, as a church body, we love, we honor, we have to practice it, guys. Um, oh yeah, I've heard already so many conversations where they would shoot the ball, how you would have done it, all that kind of stuff. Oh, the good old British stuff that's come out of every single person who thinks that they're better than the professionals instantly. I love it. It's deep embedded in the British, isn't it? We are better than whoever it fails. <laughs> it's just deeply in us. So hey, let me just encourage you. Love, forgive, bless. There you go. If we do it in church, we need to do it for football players. Anyway, um, for those who don't know, my whole family live in France, and I lived in France for 12 years, so either way, you know, I was French all the way, yeah, I was, uh, I want to see if I'm going to get cancelled by the 
before I even preach. Everyone's like, we're done. Next. He's American. He's French. What is this? Well, guys, grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 8. <clears throat> Do I have any note takers in the room? Do I have people who love their notes, their titles, all that kind of stuff? We've got a few. Okay, well, I've deliberately done titles for you today. I normally don't. I'm not a note taker myself, but Carla is, and she always tells me, it would be so much better if I knew what you were going to talk about and if I had notes. So I've done it. Today, I'm going to talk about the test of sacrifice. The test of sacrifice. And what it looks like to actually live out a life of faith. Because I, and I believe that this message today that God has given me is for each one of us. And I, I was prepping this and I was preaching to myself. I'll be honest with you. The world is not, the world is not in a good place. And we know that. But it's so important that the church knows that God is the answer. And that the church recognizes that it's our job to represent Christ. And that sounds basic, but I unfortunately hear so many Christians talk so negatively constantly about the world, about politics, about anything. And then also about the church and about themselves. And that they've got nothing to offer and the church has nothing to offer. The church is irrelevant now. And I'm like, I'm here to tell you guys, the church is not irrelevant. The church is here to stay because it's the body of Christ. But it's time for the church to stand up. And it's time for the church to actually go and do what God asked us to do. And don't misunderstand me. I'm so blessed. I get to hear about God moving all over the world. And churches are doing this. And I know that here in this house, we do do. But I just want to, this is a message to encourage you guys. There's a test of sacrifice before we encounter the favor. So Hebrews 11, verse 8. It says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents, with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Thank you, Jesus. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go. Abraham heard the call of God, and he started packing immediately. He immediately obeyed God. He was told to go, and he went. Now, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, if you've read, read the scriptures, Abraham's faith was far from perfect. Really far. I've got some, just some bullet points of Abraham's faith. All right, so Abraham is in the hall of fame of faith. This is some of the moments of his life. God told him to leave his family behind. What did he do? He took his father and his nephew. God promised him a child. What did he do? He went to his maidservant, tried to have it his own way. God said that he would protect him and no harm would come to him. And not once, but twice, he risked his wife's life to protect himself. Guys, I don't know about you. Gents, if you have, you're doing okay. As long as you haven't tried to give your wife to protect yourself, you're doing okay on your walk of faith. Somehow, through all of this, Even with all these crazy things that happen, God's commentary in Abraham's life is simple. By faith, Abraham obeyed. I don't know how Sarah felt about that when he made it to the Hall of Fame and he was she was like, "Um, he tried to, you know, use me twice, and I I don't know how she felt, his Abraham's wife felt, but you know, at the end of the day, what we think our lives are like compared to what God sees of us, sometimes are very different things. We so easily focus on the negative about ourselves. The areas that we're failing in, the areas that the church is failing in, the areas that we're not doing well enough in. And that's our view, but God sees 
our moments of obedience. God sees our faith. He sees the heart. So when Abraham obeyed, he stepped out into an adventurous life with God. He left it all to follow God into the unknown. He didn't know where he was going to go, but he stepped out and he went on a journey with God. And we can read this passage in Hebrews and go, oh, I love this story. Oh, good for you, Abraham. I like this. Well done. And after we've admired it for a little while, and we start to realize that actually what's in the word is for us today as well, and that God is trying to teach us something, that it's not random that Abraham is mentioned like this and these scriptures are there. I'll be honest, there's, there can be a little te- bit of terror that sets in. Because it's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is God calling me on an adventure? Is God asking me to step out into the unknown? Is God asking me to, to leave everything behind? Is God, w- wait, what if God is actually asking me to sacrifice? What if it's not comfortable? What if I have to live, like live as if I'm in a foreign land and live in tents? I like my comfort. I like my, my I like my, I like my, what I know. And God's going, no, I've called you into an adventure. Get ready. Church, this message is not just for missionaries, evangelists, leaders. This is for all those who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You are called into an adventurous life of faith with God. You are. See, he has massive and micro adventures for us. Some see the adventures that people go on with God. And others, it's in your day-to-day walk. But he's always asking you to go on an adventure with him. If you want to go further with God, you have to realize there is something of Abraham's faith that we need today. Faith goes on adventures with God and it requires sacrifice. It goes on adventures with God and it requires sacrifice. So how is this faith activated? So for those who are note takers, I've got four sections. If you want a title of each section, this is my first one. God's inheritance is best. God's inheritance is best. And we have to believe that. It says, verse 8 said, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he was to receive as an inheritance. God gave him a promise. He listened. He heard what God said. There's an inheritance for you. There's a promise for you. And he went after it. Now, there's a concept, a um, kingdom principle that's very different than the one on the earth. Kingdom principle is, you go and live in the land that God has, is going to give you before you even inherit it. Let's put that in our terms. That's like me saying that your grandparent is saying, hey, when I pass, this house is yours. And you go, great, I'm in tomorrow. That would be a bit awkward. <laughs> it's not how inter- inheritance works here, does it? When, when I'm gone... When, it, when it's your turn, then you can have it. It's already yours, and then you can move in. You can't move in beforehand. It's when it's yours, you can move in. The kingdom says, I'm giving you that. Go and move into it. But it's not mine yet. I know. Go and live in it. God gives us promise sometimes, and we sit on the banks of it going, okay, God, whenever it's my turn, whenever it's ready, whenever when all the giants are out, when... When the giants have disappeared, when the problems aren't there, when it's super easy, when the church has thousands of people already, when we have all the finances, when I have everything sorted, when I know everything that's going to happen, then I'll go into it. And he's going, no, no, no. I told you to go and live in that land that I will give you. I will give you as an inheritance. For some of us, we sit at the edge of our inheritance at the edge of the promise, and we just sit there, and we camp. Like the people of Israel camped outside the promised land for years, and years, and years, and they could see it. You realize that when God told Joshua, it's time to go, the giants were still there. The problems were still there. Jericho was still there. They still had to go. Now, they had promises. Their previous generations had promises, but they had to go and live in the land first. 
in order to conquer it. Abraham was convinced when God made a promise, even if he couldn't see it clearly, it was better than what he had now. And he went after it. His, he realized this, and I think this is a principle that I really want you to get. His life, our life today, is nothing compared to God's tomorrow for you. What God has done in this house already, and what he's doing in your life, is wonderful. You should never take it for granted. But his future for us is so much greater. But he's looking for a people who will go. He's looking for a people who will step out. He's looking for a people who are willing to sacrifice and go into and live in the land that they will inherit, that they haven't yet inherited. But they're trusting God's promises and going, God, you promised me this. I'm going to go and I'm going to live there and I'm going to believe in your promise time and time again until I see the promise fulfilled. We need, the church needs to stop sitting at the edge of the riverbank. We need to start actually walking into the promises. You're alive? Yeah. Are you replay, replaying the penalty in your head? Is that what's happening? It's all right. It's just a little quiet. I'm just like, I know. We just park that. It's okay. Look, the life of faith must believe in God's promises, inheritance, and ways, and believe that they are way better than anything else. They are so much better than anything else. So number two, what is it? We go into the unknown. We have to go into the unknown. It says he went out not knowing where he was going. You see, Abraham had a promise, but he didn't have the full picture. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know how he would receive the land. He didn't know how he would receive the promise. He went into the unknown. God told him to go and he went. He was obedient to the voice. You have to follow his voice over your eyes. I'll try on this side because this side is still sleeping. You have to follow his voice over your eyes. His voice says, go, you have to go. Well, okay, but what does it look like? No, go. Well, I haven't got a full plan. I know, I'll tell you on the way. See, we really struggle with that because Abraham knew that it was way better Oh, I need you to get this, so I'm going to start again. Okay, you ready? Abraham knew it was way better in the unknown with God than the known without him. Do you know that? Is that deeply embedded inside of you? That it is better in the unknown with God than the known without him? I'm comfy here. Yes, but his presence already moved. Why didn't you follow? I said this, I think it was last time I was here. We need to stop asking God to bless what we're doing and do what God is blessing. Yeah. And if God's presence moved the people in the, um, with the Ark of the Covenant, when the, when the presence moved, the people didn't stay. Yeah. They went. They followed. If the presence of God went somewhere, they were like, <laughs> ain't no way I'm staying here. He's over there. I'm going over there. Yeah. But somehow we like to do it our way. We like consumer Christianity so easily. I'm not, a, I'm not saying that we shouldn't enjoy, understand, I, was part, I love this. We need to love excellence and we need to love presenting the best for the kingdom and our best for the kingdom, absolutely. But it cannot be about consumerism. It's about a relationship. It's about sons and daughters with their father. That's what worship is. I'm there with daddy and I'm worshiping the king. And I'm loving on him. And it's not. It can't be just how I want it to be. In my comfort, at the time of day that I like, with the temperature that I like, with the, the lighting that I like, I don't know, how far do I go? Are you getting the picture? How are you, oh, I only listen to this album and that album because they're kind of like my style. I'm like, okay, look. That's not what worship is. It's where's your heart and his heart? Are they together? Have you followed his presence? Or have you been asking him to bless your preference? But God is saying, no. Abraham understood this. It's better for me to go into the unknown. Into something that's really not comfortable. Rather than stay here without him. Without his blessing. 
This is the life of faith, but we chafe up against it so often. We're Christians, which by definition means we have faith. But there's so little faith sometimes in the Christians and in ourselves. I'm not preaching against you. I'm, I'm telling you, I was convicted. I was reading this and I was just like, oh, I was just I was like, okay, this is, this is pushing against me. And I'm like, good. That's what it should be. We can't, we, we want to know what's around the corner. Oh, goodness me. Am I the only one who likes to know what's around the corner? Oh, gosh. I've had to, like, even on a practical, I've had to work on this. So, for those who know Carla, Carla is an administrator. She's got a heavenly gift of administration, and I am a blessed husband by it. Oh, my days, I can't even tell you. But then Carla has another mode, which is, eh, especially when we're on holiday. <laughs> eh, what time are we leaving? Eh, what are we doing today? Ah, eh, we'll find out. Oh, I'm I, I the only one I really struggle with. It. Even on holiday, I struggle with it. The first couple of years. So Carla's like that. Her parents are like that. So I remember, and I know they'll be watching this, so they know what I'm talking about. A few years ago, I went on, we went over to Florida to see her family. And even if it's relaxed, I still like to know what we're doing. So it's just me. Okay. I still like the idea of, thank you. A couple of people are with me today. Thank you. I still like the idea of knowing what we're going to do today. And if we say we're going to go into Miami and do some shopping and see an aquarium, I expect us to get up, have breakfast and go and do what we said we decided to do. And we got up and I'm watching the time go and they're having a great time. And they're like, should we watch a movie? And I'm like, hey, I'm just dying inside. <laughs> And then they're like, oh, you know what? I really want that kind of food. I'm like, it's 40 minutes away. Yeah, but I'm just craving it. Let's go. Let's just have a relaxed day. And everything in me is just like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm just dying inside. So I've learned, I was over there recently. You can even ask them if you, when you see them there. I deliberately was. They were like, oh, what are we doing today? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I worked on it so hard. <laughs> I had to. I just closed my eyes and just embraced the ride. I'm just... It's fine. I have to work on that. But I actually, genuinely, for our marriage, I had to work on that in the practical. We need to work on that in the spiritual. We need to be okay to not know what's around the corner. We need to be okay to not know when God says, hey, I want you to do, press into this. I want you to go after this. What's that going to look like? Come on, we'll find out. Yeah, but God, I'm not going to move until you tell me what it's going to look like. Okay, well, I'll find someone else who wants to go on an adventure then. God isn't into punishment, please understand, but he's looking for a people who obey. Yes, he's father. Yes, he's our best friend, but he is Lord and Savior. He is king. He says, go, go. We can't forget that. We serve a king. But so often we're like, I just want to know and then I'll do it. And I'm like, okay, it just won't happen. Let me just read this. James 4, if you're taking notes. James 4, verse 13. James said, come now and... You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. James was not having any of it. <laughs> Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Look, we need to submit our plans to God not God to our plans. Did that hit for a second? I actually mean that sincerely. We need to submit to God's plans, not God to our plans. I don't tell God what I'm going to do. I ask him what he's doing. I go where he wants me to go, not where I want it, what I want it to look like. And God loves to bring his people into the unknown. He does. If you're not sure of that, read the scriptures. Constantly. Unknown. Unknown. Go there. What's going to happen? Okay, I don't know. I'm going to go anyway. Time and time and time again. You, you need to understand this. The unknown isn't fully unknown when you know God. Okay, so this side of... 
Come on, come on, guys. You were, you were the fire ones at the beginning. The unknown isn't fully unknown when you know God. When you know who God is, you can trust him when he tells you to go. When you have a relationship where you trust God and you know his character, he tells you to go and you don't know where you're going, but you know who you're following. You won't know what tomorrow will bring. But God wants you to bring you into reliance upon him more than tomorrow. Are you getting that? It's not about relying on tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. I rely on him. I rely on him. I follow him, not my plans. God will often tell you the first step and then just, and wait. See what you'll do with the first step. He isn't one, uh, maybe you have a different relationship with God than I do, but he isn't one to give me a hundred point plan. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Even planting this church, we were like, God, we're doing this. What's it going to look like? Eh. And I'm just like, God, you're there, right? I'm there. Okay. Then we're going to do it. That's what we're going to do. Why? Because God's there. And he told me to go, so we went. What's it going to look like? We'll figure out on the way. I trust him. He's good. He's not going to let me fail. And he hasn't. And his favor is on us. He is, time and time again. Because we have to, we're called to submit and obey, trusting him when we move into the unknown. And it's, it's this kind of childlike, confident faith that God wants us to, to rebirth, I believe, in the church. Um, look, child, church with a big C, not you guys, you're good. But childish behavior is so often in the church. Childish behavior, and what I mean by childish behavior, rather childlike, childish behavior goes, are we there yet? I don't like this. We kind of like get pulled along kicking. And we do our walk with God. And one day we're going to end, to end up in eternity. And you can end up kicking or screaming or loving the journey. There's honestly two walks. Are you going to go and end up in heaven kicking and screaming? Or are you going to go happy and confident and blessed and look back and go, I gave it my best. I didn't know what I was doing half the time, but I'd give it, I gave it my best. Childlike behavior goes, I have no idea where we're going, but I'm going with daddy, so I'm going to have an adventure. We were here for the grotto. I can see para, um, sorry, children who really, I want to be careful. Let me say it and then I'll explain it, okay? Who really trust their parents. Now, I'm not saying kids who are screaming don't trust their parents. They're, they're having tantrums. Like, please, you understand what I'm saying? But there was a difference when they were going into Narnia, when they were going through the cupboard. Wardrobe, what did I say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wardrobe, Ursula, I do apologize. <laughs> Those who were going through the wardrobe, if you weren't there, you missed out. Oh, grown ups, you all missed out. But if you went through the wardrobe and some of the parents were like, oh, should we go? I, the parent didn't know what was going to be through there either. Should we have a look? And the kid's like, okay. And they're just loving life. <laughs> and other parents were like, even the parents were kind of like looking at it like, something's going to jump out at me. I'm like, it's a Christmas grotto. No, it's not how we, no one's going to jump out at you. It's okay. But the, and then some of the kids kind of see that and they go, oh. And this is what happens in the church. I'm going to speak to myself as a leader and the leaders around us. If the leaders act childish in their faith, the people will act childish in their faith. And guys, I need you to realize each one of you has people that you're leading. There are people who are looking up to you. You might not even realize it. You might even be young on your journey, but there are people looking at you and watching you. And if they see you with childlike faith, oh, no, yeah, God's got this. Really? You trust him? Oh, I trust him 100%. Oh, okay. It starts to build trust in God. If they see you and you're questioning everything all the time, 
and you're doubtful and you're fearful at every single step. Everything God asks you to do, you wait about six months on it and you reevaluate and you try and get as many prophetic words on it and, you know, judge it. And, well, the Lord told me to judge the word. I'm like, yes, read the scripture with leaders, not asking Bob on Google for an interpretation of a word you were given, okay? Obviously, that's none of you guys, so that's fine. But, <laughs> but this is what people do. They, they're given a word, they're told to go, and they just kind of go, well, I'm just going to park it on the shelf and let it gather so much dust I can't even see it anymore. And it's, it's time for the church to step up again and start going and doing and acting, representing the kingdom, and have a childlike faith that goes, I don't know where we're going, but I trust the one I'm following. I 100% trust him. So number three, for time's sake, we have to leave comfort. We have to leave our comfort. Oh, guys, this is big. Hebrews uh, verse nine says, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents. It wasn't comfortable. He left his comfort of his home. He left the comfort of his family. He left the comfort of what he knew. To follow God into the unknown because he said yes to God above all else. In Genesis 12 where this story takes place, he actually says, Go out from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Again, he didn't know where he was going. But God said, go, leave all the comfort behind. And he said, yes, God, I follow. My faith is obedient, so I follow. See, Abraham was living in a culturally advanced society in his day, uh, especially compared to Canaan, where he ended up going. And it was a land filled with idolatry. It was a land full of unbelief and advanced society. Ring a bell to anyone where we live right now? No? A land where the person is king person is God. My feelings rule all. What I lo- want to do is what I'll do. Anything I don't want to do or anything I don't like coming out of you, I'm going to punish. I'm going to attack. I get it my own way. I can have all my comfort. I could be, I could literally never have to leave my living room ever again. I could never have to interact with a human being face to face ever again. I could do everything, however I want, when I want. And if it doesn't happen in five seconds, I'll write a review about it. And we, can, we live in a society like that today. Very much so. But we're not called to be part of this world. We're called to live in it and affect it for the king. But not adopt its, its ways. Hmm. Abraham had to leave the world system behind. And believe it, today, the church, we need to do the same. Look, I'm not anti-world. Please understand. I, I hear this so often and it's, mis, it's misinterpreted and it's misused. I love the world because God loves the world. He loves his people. I don't love what's in the world. Now, God can use those things. He can redeem them. Yes, we're in a time where God is looking to redeem and reform the world, and we need to be a part of that. But we cannot stay in the comfort of it and expect God to move. I heard this. Um, I was listening to a talk about church leadership and this kind of stuff, and I heard this guy uh, say, we we so often like, we, we think the answer is to build church as if it was fast food. Come in, get what you want, however you want it, exactly as you want it, and get out as fast as possible. But actually, if we look in the scriptures, how does God operate? Real slow roast. He takes his time. He makes us wait. He says, go, and I'll be there. And they went, 120. And how long did they wait? Can you imagine if... The church was asked today to go into a room and pray until God showed up. How many would leave after 20 minutes? Again, I'm not having to go. I'm I'm talking about myself. I'm like, I want to pursue God with everything I want, but we create even our own Christian lives with, I'll give 10 minutes in the morning of prayer and expect my life to be extraordinary. 
And God's saying, no, come and be with me. Come and show me that you want the mysteries. Show me that you want to be equipped. Show me that you actually really mean that I am fully, you are fully mine. God wants everything of us. See, it's a side part, but I'm going to go there. I was talking recently with someone who was like, oh, they were reading the Old Testament. They were like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we don't live in a covenant of sacrifice anymore. Can you imagine everything we did? We have to remember how many sheep, how many goats, how to burn it, when to burn it, what day I could do it. Oh my gosh, it'd be so much. And I was like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm really grateful for that too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I am extremely thankful to God that I was born the day I'm born, where I'm born and that I'm this covenant with God. It's extraordinary. But don't think that we're not in a covenant of sacrifice anymore. Sacrifice actually got greater. We are now the sacrifice. Do, do you understand what covenant we live in? Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us, for our sins, but for us to do the work he wants us to do, we have to die to ourselves. We, what, what does the sacrifice do? It dies. We are the sacrifice. We are there to continually, daily die to ourselves, to be an offering unto God. For every part of our lives to be him over me. For everything that I do to be focused on him rather than what I want to do. For my plans for tomorrow to not be based on my preferences, but on what he's actually asking of me. We are a living sacrifice, church. A little bit of a, are you, in, are you agreeing or disagreeing? It's quiet in the room. Do you recognize that you are a living sacrifice to God? That you don't get to live in comfort anymore? I'm not talking about your homes. I'm not talking about that. But if God is calling you to the nations, go to the nations. If God is calling you to give someone a finance, give them. If God is asking you to get up at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. Or, or come in the evening to pray because God has put a fire inside of you that says, I, you have an experience with God. You have an encounter with God. I've seen this so many times. I had it for myself. Look, I'm going to put hands on the heart. I went to Raleigh, um, North Carolina recently. I was in Catch the Fire with Tony. I had an incredible encounter with God. Radically hit me. I've never been impacted by the presence of God like that before. And then when I was there, I was like, God, my life is going to be the, forever changed. About 10, uh, a week ago, so I'd been back for about 10 days, life was happening. Life was happening. We lost friends. We lost family members. There were situations going on that needed our attention. And I was not fueling the fire. I wasn't not loving God. I wasn't not spending time with him. But I was not the same sacrifice I was at that moment. I was not willing to get up at 3 a.m. and I spent an hour in his presence just because he was moving and touching me and it mattered more for me to hear from him than sleep. We can't be willing to be saying, I want revival but not willing to pay the price for it. We can't say, I want a faith that obeys God but only on the things that are on my checklist that I'm, I'm happy with. You need to start ripping up the checklist. You need to start realizing that your discomfort is God's blessing. It is. You inherit the land when you're willing to sacrifice and go and live in it. And you don't know what it's going to look like, but it's time to go. Church, it's time to go. I can bet that every single one of you in this room has a promise from God that you haven't seen fulfilled yet. Is that because God's not fulfilling it or because we haven't stepped into it? I'll leave you to ask God that. God is looking for a people who have a faith like Abraham, who didn't know what he was gonna, what it was gonna look like, but he went. And he sacrificed that and he left the comfort and he left the convenience and he gave it his absolute best. My final point, if you're taking notes, is we need to have a heavenly purpose. Just let for the next five minutes, let me just tell you about this because <clears throat> I love this so much. Your walk of faith will create a future for the generations to come. 
It's all about legacy, and we've been hearing about that a lot in this house recently. It's all about legacy. Verse 9 and 10, what does it say? He went and he was living in the tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. For those who don't know, Isaac and Jacob, that's Abraham's son and grandson. They were living in the tent with him and they became heirs of the same promise. Not because God gave it directly to them, but because he gave it to Abraham. And Abraham went on this journey and he took them along with him. They became heirs of a promise that God had made to Abraham because he dwelled with them. He imparted it to them. He fought for it for them. And look, we know the story. Um, that promise of the land um, that we see in Genesis 15, if you're going to look back on the, on the passage, um, wasn't f- completely fulfilled with either Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. But we know today that it is. We're still part of it, aren't we? That promise that God gave to Abraham. I will give you the sentence more numerous than the stars. I'm paraphrasing. We are part of that today. What if Abraham never went? What if he didn't take, you know, what if Isaac and Jacob went along for the ride? What if it ended just with him? What if he never passed that on? What if he never taught his son and his grandson about faith? about trusting God, even about things that you can't see yet, about being willing to sacrifice in order to gain God's favor. God's promises over you are not just for you. I need you to understand that. His promises over you are not just for you. Abraham, and by extension, his children and his children's children looked beyond their own lives and saw something and they gave it their best. They gave it their all. And yes, like I said, they made many mistakes on the way. (laughs) They all did, each one of them. But God's summary of their life is so simple. God's summary of Abraham's life is so short and simple. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed. The reference there that we see in verse um, 10, where it says, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. This reference to the city is an echo of the prophetic vision that we see in uh, Ezekiel 40 and Isaiah um, 60 of the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of God. In Ezekiel 40 and Isaiah 60, there's these prophetic words, and and it starts with, There is a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. And this is echoing the same thing. That Abraham did all of his journey because he had his eyes set on eternity. He had his eyes set on the kingdom of God. He didn't look at this. He looked up there. And he went, that's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm teaching my kids to look at. That's what I'm teaching my children's children to look at. My eyes are set on eternity. My eyes set, my whole life set, that I will sacrifice whatever it costs to follow Jesus, to follow God, to give him my absolute best. I will be a man known of obedience. I want to obey God above all else. He didn't have an earthly purpose, he had a heavenly purpose. So you can't, we, we all want the favor of God, all right? We all want him to bless us, We want to see our children blessed. We want to see our families blessed. You have to pass the test of sacrifice before you can enter into the test of favor. I don't have time to talk about the test of favor, but trust me, favor is not. It's a test in itself. But you pass the test of sacrifice before you enter the favor. We can't, the church can't remain comfortable and achieve everything that God's called us to do. To take the land for him. 
your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Who carries that responsibility? We do. We are called as God's people to demonstrate the kingdom of God here on earth. We cannot do that comfortably. We cannot do that without stepping into the unknown. We cannot do that without sacrifice. We can't be... Are you, are you understanding? Uh, is it just hitting a little hard? It's okay. I promise you, you're doing well. But it's, I just feel it's time for the church to go, I need to sign up again. I got too comfortable. I'm very comfortable being a consumer Sunday, and I'm not looking at, please understand, this isn't, an, it's not in my nature to be um, judgmental. It's just really not, because who am I to, to ever be able to be judgmental if God isn't towards me? But we have to stand here and go, wait, I need to take account. I need to self-reflect. I'm going to ask the, the worship team if they can come up. And just go, have I got comfortable? Am I doing what I want to do or what God's called me to do? Am I living in obedience to him? Is my faith obedient? Just close your eyes for a second. please. Just focus on him right now. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now. Just impact lives right now. God's goodness that leads us to repentance. It's not shame. I'm not looking for a moment of shame here. We're looking to go, Holy Spirit, have I got comfortable where I shouldn't? Have I stopped being willing to sacrifice for you? Well, the promises that you put in front of me, that you have put into my heart, that I haven't seen come to pass because I was unwilling to go to inherit the land. Because I was unwilling to leave my comfort behind. Because I was unwilling to, to, to step out not knowing what tomorrow will bring, what it's gonna look like. But I'm here to tell you, God is looking right now for a people who want to be living sacrifices. God is looking for a people who will go before he even says another word. I have this for you. I'm there. I want you to step out. I'm already out the door. <laughs> God, use me. Hey, it's not going to be pretty. The journey might be bumpy. Use me, God. My life is yours. Whatever you ask of me, I will do. Wherever you tell me to go, I will go. Whatever you ask me to say, I will say. Whatever you ask me to lay down, I will lay down before you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to hand back over to the worship team, but... I want to invite you. That I know Tony's um, shared on this as well recently, but there's a there's something about the representation of the altar with the front. I want to I want to be very clear. It's not more holy up front, okay? But there is something about a physical act before God that unlocks a spiritual release. We call it prophetic acts. Just a very quick explanation. When I say prophetic act, it's a physical act that, re that brings about a spiritual release. That's what a prophetic act is. So when we say, put your hands out to receive, sorry, no one's going to actually put a present in your hands. But you are putting yourself out as an act to receive from God spiritually. So when I say, guys, if you want to sign up again, I'm not saying sign up to Jesus, but just say, I've got too comfortable and I need to not be comfortable anymore. 
I want to invite you to come to the front. There's space at the front, there's space at the sides, and we've got a ministry team. And I want you to come and do a physical act to, show, to tell God, I mean what I'm saying in my heart. <laughs> I mean it when I say I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I mean it when I'm saying I want to give my all to him and I want to go into the unknown. I want to go on an adventure with you, God. But some of you, maybe you just haven't been on any adventures with God recently. He wants to take you on one. Maybe you've never been on one before. I can promise you, he wants to take you on one. So I'm going to invite you to come to the front. The worship team is going to play. If I could have the ministry team, I'm going to hand over to you guys to do what you do. But guys, come on up and do business with God. Sign up again. Sign up afresh. Can you stand with me as we go in? Thank you for joining us this morning. Please subscribe for more ministry from LifeSpring.